This is Thursday, the 6th of May, 2020. People should have notes out. And we started class with a brief song from the movie Cabaret, showing a beautiful bucolic scene of the German countryside where people were gathered in an outside beer garden to sing and talk. And a beautiful young man begins singing, Tomorrow Belongs to Me. Of course, he's a member of the S.A. Just a little triumphalism. Understand that one of the things that totalitarians do to convince people that they are the inevitable rulers is they speak in inevitable terms. The inevitability of the triumph of the will, the inevitability of this young Nazi claiming tomorrow for himself. I can't tell you the number of times I've been in debates with other teachers about policy, mostly at other schools, and they have assumed victory in their hearts. Well, this is going to happen. You might as well just get used to it. To which I say, <laughs> it ain't done until the fat lady sings. Um... You may want things to happen your way. You may believe that that's the wave of the future, but that belief does not necessarily either ring true or produce anything other than a degree of brittle overconfidence. Bear this in mind, because many people who have bright, shiny ideas that are dangerous about the future claim that it's progressive or futuristic or inevitable or the time is right or it's long overdue or it's the right thing to do. They claim an objective rectitude which no human being owns, assuming that their assumptions, their sense of proportion, their sense of priority, their goals are objectively reflected in the reality around us and no one on the right or on the left or anywhere between or beyond possesses that kind of truth. We aspire to it. We try to grapple it like touching the St. Elmo's fire, but we don't have it. It's not ours. Truth does not belong to us. <coughs> not to any one of us. At best, we can aspire to belong to truth. But none of us possess it. I don't, you don't. No political leader does. Beware of triumphalism. It's a tactic. It's a technique. It's designed to silence opposition and gin up support among the already believing. But it's objectively a fraud. No one knows what the future holds. No one knows what's best. Knows. We think. We don't know. That degree of humility, and almost wry humility, can be quite the inoculant against fanaticism. Remember that the next time you feel tempted to be caught up in somebody else's crusade. Maybe it's a crusade you'll choose to join, but don't join in a froth of emotion. Join because you judge it's the right thing from your point of view. But always remember, you don't know. You don't know. I don't either. And that sense that we know is the root of a hell of a lot of evil. Appeasement means giving a bully what he wants so that he will go away. Giving a bully what he wants so that he will go away. That is appeasement. Paying an aggressor to bully you, that's another way of doing it. If you give in to a bully, if you give the bully your pride, your submission, maybe your lunch money, you are literally paying your victimizer. You are rewarding it. By giving that person what they want, you are incentivizing them to come back. Ah, Kipling, the great poet of the British Empire, wrote about this 
in his poem, Danegeld, which is, by the way, oddly enough, one of the things that I am dealing with with my ancient and medieval students. We're doing Dark Age England right now, the establishment of it. So, let's read it. I will read it. I don't expect you to see it up there because I'm not projecting. Kipling's poem, Danegeld, and he has here dates A980 to 1016, but the truth is it applies earlier than that. It is always a temptation to an armed and agile nation to call upon a neighbor and to say, We invaded you last night. We are quite prepared to fight unless you pay us cash to go away. And that is called asking for Danegeld. And the people who ask it explain that you've only to give him the Dane Geld, and then you'll get rid of the Dane. That's what projected. Would you shut the right light switch off, please? It is always a temptation for a rich and lazy nation to puff and look important and to say, though we know we should defeat you, we have not the time to meet you. We will therefore pay you cash to go away. And that is called paying for Dane Geld. But we've proved it again and again <coughs> that if once you have paid him the Dane Geld, you never get rid of the Dane. It is wrong to put temptation in the path of any nation for fear they should succumb and go astray. So when you are requested to pay up or be molested, you will find it better policy to say, we never pay anyone Dane Geld, no matter how trifling the cost, for the end of that game is oppression and shame, and the nation that pays it is lost. Appeasement is tempting light because if you give the bully what he wants he might go away for a while but you're ensuring that he'll be back it's a morally corrupt bargain you're rewarding evil and you're encouraging evil not only to continue to victimize you but anyone else that it can who's like you Appeasement is the route that the peoples of the West and their leaders chose to deal with the rising aggression of the new totalitarian states. Again and again, lines were drawn and lines were crossed. And again and again, nothing was done. In desperate hope to avoid war, their cowardice ensured it. We start with Japan. Arguably, the Second World War begins in August, to, in, I'm sorry, in July, uh, well, the summer of 1914, with the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, because the series of events that lead to World War I also directly lead to World War II. Another argument is that World War II actually begins in October of 1931. Oh, sorry, in September of 1931. Because for the first time, the post-World World, World, World War I order is violated with violence. Okay, here's the story. Where's my orange? Orange, orange, orange. So, the Japanese Empire includes Southern Sakhalin Island, which they won from Russia. Hokkaido Island, Honshu, Shikoku, which I didn't draw, Kyushu. These are the Japanese home islands, well, most of them, except for Sakhalin, which is taken from the Russians. 
The Japanese also control the Ryukyus, including Okinawa. The Japanese have taken Taiwan, which um, was a result of the Sino-Japanese War of 1894. Uh, the Japanese also won Korea in that war. <coughs> And there has always been in East Asia an open question. See, the Russians hold Vladivostok, and the Russian border is roughly here. But even though the Russians eventually do build as part of their Trans Siberian Railroad, which causes the Russo-Japanese War, a spur around the Amor River region. The logical thing to do, bless you, is to put your railroad through the shortest route, and that is through a region of China, known as Manchuria. Manchuria is the area north of Korea, west of the Amor River region and east of Mongolia. Which is beginning there. Now, kind of important. The Russians and the Japanese have been struggling over this area for a while because after the Sino-Japanese War, the Japanese wanted the city of Port Arthur on the end of this peninsula, the uh, Liaplong Peninsula. The Russians kick them out and say, it's ours. The Russians also say they want Manchuria from China, at least they want special rights there, so that their, their railroad can be protected. The Japanese, in the Russo-Japanese War, pushed the Russians back, but because of a series of international agreements, the Japanese do not get their claim over Manchuria recognized. What they do get is their claim over the Liatlong Peninsula and the city of Port Arthur recognized, which is something. They also get a bunch of islands over here that the Germans used to have. Now, after World War I, the Japanese begin to see themselves as the champion of the Asiatics, the champion of the Eastern peoples against Europe, because the Europeans have had it their own way for hundreds of years because of gunpowder and everything else. But the Sino-Japanese War proves the Japanese are supreme in Asia over the former central kingdom, China. In 1904, they proved they're superior to a white power, a European power, the Russian Empire. In 1914, with the uh, assistance, or at least the uh, cheering on of Britain and France, Japan conquers the German territories in East Asia. So... Japan has become more European than the Europeans. Japan has achieved the strength that the people desperately wanted after the arrival of the Americans in 1854, which threatened their emperor. But the young men in the Japanese army don't want to take a slow, measured, evolutionary pace towards Japan becoming the center of a Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, which is their term. Sounds better in Japanese. The Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere is a euphemism for the Japanese Empire, which will dominate, they believe, they want, not only Korea, the Ryukyus, Taiwan, but will dominate China, Vietnam, and the rest of Indochina, the Philippines, the Dutch East Indies, that Asia will be for the Asiatics again, and that Japan, being the chief Asian nation, will dominate Asia. Even British India 
is going to be switched to Japanese Indian if the plan goes right. So, these young army officers want this soon, not late. They want this now, not later. The city of Mukden is an important rail juncture in Manchuria, connecting the Korean railroad that Japan runs with the Russian railroad that connects Vladivostok across Manchuria. So, what the Japanese lieutenants and captains prepared is an incident where Chinese bandits, quote unquote, attack the rail yards at Mukden. And in response to the Chinese aggression, the Japanese army in Manchuria will start moving out from the railroads and a massive army will cross the Korean frontier and Manchuria will be conquered. This is the plan of young men in their late 20s and early 30s. They do not discuss it with anyone in Tokyo, the capital. In September, on the morning of September 18th or 19th, the old men in Tokyo who think they're running the Japanese government and Japanese army awaken to discover that their nation is at war. They didn't order it. They didn't know about it. And then messages begin to come in. I told you about the Japanese system of patron-client relationships. It's a lot like the Romans. In a typical system of patron-client relationships, a young, ambitious man pledges loyalty and service to an old, powerful, wealthy man. The old, powerful, wealthy man gives the young man advice. The young man gives the old man support. That's the deal. That's the way things are done in most civilized countries, honestly. Um, it's not the way we do things. Much. But it is the way Rome did things, and it is the way Japan did things. However, being Japanese, they turn it up to 11. That means that the old man can ask for service up to and including even the death of the young man. But because the young man is pledging nothing less than his life to the old man, the young man can ask for an unspecified favor in return for all of the service he's going to give. And that unspecified favor, well, the whole point of it being unspecified is it can be anything. The young officers are calling in their favors to the old men who run the general staff and the government. Now, the men who run Japan in the name of the emperor have a choice to make. They can follow the system of honor and of patron-client relationships and back up the young officers and retroactively approve the war to conquer Manchuria. Or they can slap them down in the name of the power of the national government to decide when to make war and when not to make war. But this could result not only in the humiliation of Japan in the face of the Chinese bandits and the Chinese army, but it also could show weakness to the other nations of the world. Plus, those young army men might not listen. And then we'd be in a state where Japan might be facing a civil war with its best army on the other side. They play it safe. God help us from people who always play it safe. They back the young officers. They avoid a crisis. They avoid a civil war. They avoid the possibility of open rebellion. They avoid being shown as weak and out of control in front of the rest of the world. They play it safe 
They cover it up. The former emperor of China, the last of the Manchu emperors, Pu Yi, becomes the puppet ruler of Japanese Manchu Kuo. Manchu Kuo, the new name, is incorporated into the Japanese Empire, and Pu Yi basically is a rubber stamp. For whatever Japan wants, he approves. He had been deposed in 1912 by the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party of China, led by Sun Yat-sen. So Japan has invaded and conquered a part of China, pretty darn big part of China at that, a part of China that has coal, iron ore, in other words, the basis for industrialism. These are critical industries and critical raw materials Japan needs. And now Japan has it. Japan has enlarged its territory in the north. Well, the junior officers did. They're emboldened. From now on, the Japanese army is going to be led from its lower ranks of officers. They're going to be the dynamic ones. The old men are going to try to cover things up and make believe they're in charge. But more and more, increasingly more, and people are afraid of the young officers. They're afraid of their violent tendencies. They're afraid of their bold ideas. They're afraid of the capacity of those young officers to overthrow the government in the name of the emperor. They're afraid even of the young officers committing mass suicide as a statement of who they are, of their dedication and their intent. However, the world has a system. Woodrow Wilson set it up, even if America is not involved. The League of Nations meets to deal with the Manchuria crisis. Speeches are made. How aggression has occurred. National borders have been crossed for the first time since the aftermath of World War I. Open war is being waged. What shall be done? The Japanese ambassador gets up going to answer these claims, everyone listens, and says in so many words, well, if you're going to be like that, we quit! And he and the Dap Japanese delegation leave the League of Nations, showing contempt. What's the League to do? They make speeches. They write letters. They send diplomatic communique. Naughty, naughty Japan. You shouldn't leave the League. You shouldn't take Manchuria. You should give it back. You should. Really? But other than that talk and a few minor economic sanctions, they do nothing. Let's talk about sanctions because this is going to be used again and again uh, up to the present day as a step between peace and war. Naughty Nation, A. I'm sorry, no, no, it should be Naughty, Naughty Nation N, if we're going to do this right, because it's Naughty. Naughty Nation N. By the way, um, New Balance sneakers in Germany are very controversial. You know why? Because they have an N on them. What could the N mean in Germany? Hmm. People actually associate New Balance shoes and sneakers <coughs> with neo-Nazis. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> so, Naughty Nation N does naughtiness as a nation. The rest of the world could fight Naughty Nation N, drive it back within its borders, smack it, overthrow its government. But that's war, and war is scary. We've outgrown war. We're too good for war. Let's sanction them. It's the equivalent of a national-scale boycott. We won't buy their goods. We won't let them sell their goods. We'll have nothing to do with their trade. The trade war will help weaken the government. They'll be overthrown by their own people. And then a new, nicer government will take over and the naughty nation will make nice. <sighs> Unless the sanctions are truly thoroughgoing, which they were against Iran under Trump, unless it really bites into the national economy. This is what always happens with sanctions in dictatorships. 
The dictator rails against the sanctions, decrying them as international blackmail. And then all of the misery is shunted down to the level of the everyday citizen. The dictator still lives with his Rolls Royce and his palace and his harem and all of the things that being a dictator gives you. They eat every about every calorie of food they would have eaten before. They drive wherever they want to go. They live in the lap of luxury, just like before. But the average life style of the average citizen goes down. But being a dictatorship, they have an effective secret police that's militarized. So anyone who even tries to talk rebellion gets the chop or gets the re-education or gets to go to a camp. Sanctions end up punishing the slave populations of dictatorships, not the dictators themselves. They almost never work. But they make you feel good because you're doing something that's ineffective, that's symbolic, that's going to hurt people who are not responsible for the problem, but it feels good. So, the League of Nations, strike one, fails to stop aggression, which is what it's for. Okay. We'll continue with Japan, even though the next event is caused by Italy. In 1937, Japan has taken control of Manchuria and of the intermediary province known as Jehol. J-E-H-O-L. They are close to Peking, what they then called Beijing, which is about here. Well, in 1937, the Japanese officers of the army, junior officers, and this time mid-level officers who've been promoted, decide that it's time. We're going to stop being held back by those racist whites in Europe and America. We're going to, and they talk in these terms, we're going to stop being held back by the old man in Tokyo. The emperor deserves better. So what we're going to do is we're going to definitively demonstrate our superiority in Asia by conquering at least the key parts of the Middle Kingdom itself. So, Japanese forces invade China from Jehol, from Manchuria, uh, from bases along the coast that the Japanese have, particularly Shanghai. They begin moving inland. The Japanese also have forces on the major Chinese rivers, the Yangtze and the Huangho, the Yangtze Kiang and the, uh, the Yellow River. So, Japanese forces begin a general attack, and at this time, the capital city of China is the city of Nanking, what we now call Nanjing in the new translation. This attack happens all over China at the same time. Once again, the imperial government in Tokyo is forced into it. This time, they know about it because there are a series of assassinations of anti-army politicians. Anyone who's going to stand up to the army ends up accidentally being in the path of a bullet. Who would have thought? That's a shame. It's a real shame that all those anti-army politicians just, you know, happen to be there. You know, wrong way at the wrong time. That's like not even yeah. <laughs> So the imperial government is forced to go along with this under the pressure of the young, and this time young, low-level and mid-level army officers who want to again glorify the empire. Now, this is a general attack, and what it's going to result in, ultimately, is that much of coastal China is going to come under Japanese rule. The Chinese are divided. Their main government is led by Chiang Kai-shek, a general, calling himself Generalissimo, the head of the KMT, the Kuomintang, the Chinese National Party. They have like a gear wheel flag. It looks a bit like an American flag. 
Uh, it's got a red field, and then where we have the blue, they have the blue, but instead of a bunch of little stars, they have a big sun symbol. It's a round symbol with little points around it. It looks like a gear wheel. Chiang Kai-shek has been fighting the communists and a group of warlords that have taken over China since he took over the Kuomintang after Sun Yat-sen's death. The Soviets are not backing the communists. The communists are hiding out in the mountains. The Soviets are backing Chiang Kai-shek. So the Soviets are backing the Chinese who are trying to fight against this Japanese aggression. But the Japanese outclassed the Chinese at this time without any trouble. The soldiers are better equipped, better trained, more vicious, more aggressive. The Chinese still fight with Sun Tzu methods. If you've ever heard of Sun Tzu, he wrote The Art of War, which is a Chinese book of martial philosophy, which basically talks about war and balance. You fight not to destroy your enemy, but to force your enemy to flee. You allow your enemy a route of retreat always, because this way you will spend less of your troops. It's a much more sort of balanced approach to war, but it doesn't lead to quick victories. The Japanese follow the European approach to war, which is victory quickly at all costs, no matter how violent you need to be. One of the things the Japanese are going to do to demonstrate how China should surrender now, 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 is known to history as the Rape of Nanking. Nanking is the capital city of China at this time. It's where Chiang Kai-shek's government was based. Nanking is also a relic of the past. It's a city that's still walled. It has these beautiful medieval walls that encompass it, surround it. Big, tall, thick walls. Even cannon-resistant walls. Those walls don't keep the Japanese out. The Japanese seize the gates, they seize the walls, they control the walls. Those walls will trap the population of the city of Nanking in. When the Japanese go to Nanking, the senior officers claim that they lose control of their own army. Remember all that brutality I told you about with the training of Japanese soldiers? The fact that each and every one of them is systematically brutalized to create a fiery anger within them. Well, that fiery anger comes out in the form of gang mass rape of the female population and the brutal killing with bayonets, usually, of boys and men, of old women and old men, of little girls. The Japanese army behaves in a manner that's indescribable. Barbarians don't behave that way. And this goes on day after day after day. It's not called the rape of Nanking for nothing. Tens of thousands of dead. Hundreds of thousands of brutalized people. No Chinese civilian in the city of Nanking gets out alive the way they were. Those who physically survive are never the same. Today, the Chinese Communist Party uses anti-Japanese propaganda to unify Chinese people. The way Hitler demonized the Jews, the Chinese Communist Party demonizes the Japanese. But unlike Hitler, the Chinese Communist Party do have several events that are real, that Japan perpetrated on China, that are truly worthy of outrage. The rape of Nanking is chief among them. The capitalist city of China is destroyed for all intents and purposes as a place where people feel home. Now, upriver of Nanking on the Yangtze is one of hundreds of foreign gunboats, the gunboat USS Panay. The Panay was won from Spain in the Spanish-American War. It's an anachronism, a flat-bottomed riverboat with some small caliber guns and sailors that function as ship's troops when they need to. The Panay's real work is done by Chinese coolie labor. Coolies come on board and they do all the laundry and they work in the engine room and they, they do the work for their rice bowls. The men on the Panay live like kings, but they're expected to fight. Still, 
What they're there to do is show the flag, protect American missionaries, protect U.S. interests. Well, early in the Japanese attack, the Panay is steaming upriver from Nanking because the area around Nanking is heavily being invested by the Japanese army. This is as the rape of Nanking is beginning. And one bright morning, our guys looked up, flying the big American flag, the way American Navy ships do. And our troops, our, our sailors, see formation of uh, gull-colored uh, Japanese planes with red meatballs on their sides. The Japanese planes begin to dive, stooping like an evil, like an evil, like an eagle on a ground target. But it's not a target on the shore. It's the Pan A itself. Japanese fighters strafe the Pan A. That means they fly over it firing their machine guns. They bomb the Pan A. A second wave comes in. By this point, the American sailors have spread a giant American flag across the roof of the ship. There's no way they could have avoided seeing it. The attack intensifies. A third wave comes in. The Panay is sunk. This is an absolutely purposeful act. The crew of the Panay that survives goes ashore. For the next few weeks, the survivors of the Panay evade Japanese patrols. Those who are caught are killed. Accidentally. Accidentally. Finally, groups of Americans uh, find a British gunboat south, uh, or should I say uh, west of Nanking. They board it and they try to get away and they barely get past a Japanese gunboat that doesn't want them to leave. The Japanese claim after the fact that it was an accident. But while they're claiming that, their troops are trying to hunt down our guys who are kept alive by Chinese resistance fighters, resistance fighters and by their own skill. Why did the Japanese Empire attack an American gunboat? Well, to prove a point, China used to be equally victimized by everyone. Everyone could put gunboats up China's rivers, could march troops around China protecting their interests. That was the open door policy. It was better than having China carved up into imperial colonies. Japan is asserting that the open door policy has just slammed shut. That Japan has taken China, is taking China, and that it would be a real shame if all the foreigners that stayed in China were accidentally offed by the Japanese military. It was a quiet statement, get out now. The American government, for reasons that made sense to it, accepted this Japanese explanation that it was an accident. Most of our men came home. The issue was a celeb uh, was a was a caused a, a brief furor in the press, but eventually the world went on to other things. This brief furor in the press was hushed up by the Roosevelt administration, Franklin Roosevelt, because we weren't ready for war with Japan in 1937. Military spending has increased. Spending on our Navy and our Marines, who would bear the brunt of the fighting against the Japanese, was dramatically increased. Roosevelt, at this moment, becomes convinced that war with Japan is inevitable. So, does he appease the Japanese after the Panay incident? Kind of. But... He does so to buy time to build up America's forces so that we theoretically will be stronger. Better able to defend the American Philippines. Remember, the Philippines are an American colony at this time. Better able to defend American interests in China with our Chinese allies. Roosevelt begins to build the 
framework that will help us win ultimately World War II in the Pacific. So that's Japan. Italy, well, Italy has a slightly different story. Italy was like Germany, late to the imperial race, because Italy wasn't even a country until 1871. Well, not really. And the Italians had been humiliated in Africa. In Libya, the Italians had been defeated in their attempt to make Libya part of the Italian Empire. And in Ethiopia, in the Horn of Africa, if you look at the map behind Sam, you'll see on the right of Africa, about a third, well, maybe more than about 40% of the way down on the right side, what looks like a rhino horn or a triceratops horn sticking out, south of Arabia. That's the Horn of Africa. That's where Somalia is. Those mountains to the left, or, uh, what are we talking about? Did I say left? Okay. On the right side of Africa, about 40% down, you'll see a horn facing rightward, facing eastward. That's the Horn of Africa. That's Somalia. To the left or west of Somalia, you see a bunch of mountains. That's Ethiopia, the source of the Blue Nile the Christian kingdom of the Coptic Church. Well, in the 1890s, at the Battle of Adawa, Italians who control the coastal area of Ethiopia, called Eritrea, try invading into the interior, and they get slaughtered. So the Italians make do with the coastal area until Mussolini in 1936 say it's time. The Libyans have been brought to heel by a general named Graziani, who uh, employs poison gas on the Libyan uh, rebels. I was wrong when I said poison gas it wasn't used after World War I. The Aitais used it against the uh, Libyans. Now it's Ethiopia's turn. The Italian defeat in Libya has been avenged. The Italian defeat in Ethiopia must be avenged. So Mussolini invades Italy, uh, invades Abyssinia or uh, Ethiopia, their alternate names, with a modern mechanized army, armored cars, light tanks, medium tanks, artillery, aircraft, fighters, bombers. The Ethiopians have cavalry with lances, spears against machine guns, horsemen against tanks, and yeah. The Italian army bogs down in the mountains. The Ethiopians actually begin winning battles. At this point, the emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, the Lion of Judah, the man who the Rastafarians believe is the incarnation of God, the Messiah. No joke. The emperor Haile Selassie goes to Geneva to speak before the League of Nations. And he, he makes an impassioned plea for the League to intervene and protect the independence of this Christian African kingdom. Remember, the Coptic Church is older than the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches. The Coptic Church is founded at a time when the Christians in the Roman Empire are underground being persecuted. It is the oldest organized Christian church in the world. The Ethiopians have never been a part of Europe's empires. Selassie makes an incredible speech. The League applauds. The League commiserates. The League does nothing. They levy a few sanctions against Italy. Italy brushes it off. The League did nothing when Manchuria was invaded. The League did nothing when Italy conquers Abyssinia. Steer right to! And then the next year, when Japan goes after the rest of China, the League is basically gone. In fact, after it fails to stop the Italians, the League is basically gone. The League proves itself a failure and utterly useless and cannot deter aggression. The whole point of an international body is to do that. As much as I have contempt for the today's United Nations organization as a failed and corrupt body, it actually did justify its existence once. 
North Korea invades South Korea in the summer of 1950. The Soviets are boycotting because we won't let the People's Republic of China uh, into the UN. Instead, we support nationalist China. While they're brooding in their tent like Achilles, the United Nations votes to go to war in Korea to push the North Koreans back. It actually helps, along with America, preserve a distinct free South Korea. On one occasion, the UN actually does real good. The League never did. Italy now is in control of Ethiopia. And in 1939, before the beginning of World War II, in early 1939, Italy invades Albania, which is a Muslim country in Europe across the Adriatic Sea, just northwest of Greece, right about here. The Italians cross. Now, the Italian army is a mixture of sort of a Charlie Chaplin buffoon army and people who are genuinely cruel. They have a really nasty record of dealing with people weaker than them, including the use of torture, poison gas, uh, the mass slaughter of civilians. They're like a classic bully in this sense, psychologically. They're cowardly in the face of a stronger opponent. And the Italians do not fight well against the British or the Americans when push comes to shove. But if they're winning, if they're in charge, they're cruel. This is Mussolini's influence. Next time, we talk about Spain and Germany. Thank you. Have a good weekend.